Minister of Home Affairs and Information, Honorable Wilfred Abrams, MP. Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Home Affairs and Information, Mr. Curtis Jokes. Chairman of the Board of Directors of the National Council on Substance Abuse and the Deputy Chairman, along with respective members of the Board of Directors of the NCSA. NCSA Manager, Mrs. Betty Hunt. Deputy Manager, Mr. Troy Wickham. NCSA Research and Information Officer and the Barden 2021 Report Presenter, Mrs. Laura Foster. Mental Health and Family Therapist, Mrs. Sharon Moaz. Respective officers from the Government of Barbados and represented representatives of stakeholder agencies. NCSA Information Technology Officer, respective members of staff, and NCSA Media Consultant, representative of the Sky Lounge Media, respective members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to have you here with us at the National Council on Substance Abuse for the release of findings from the 2021 Barbados Drug Information Network report. Without further ado, it is a pleasure to now invite to deliver the official welcome, our indomitable manager, Mrs. Betty Hunt. Please welcome her. Thank you, Paul Vett. Minister of Home Affairs and Information, the Honorable Wilfred Abrams, MP. Mr. Curtis Jilks, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Home Affairs and Information. Members of the Board of Directors of the National Council on Substance Abuse. Representatives of our burden stakeholders gathered here. Staff and volunteers of the National Council on Substance Abuse. Members of the media, those of you who are joining us online, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I offer apologies, of course, for our chairman, Hadford Howell, who is unable to join us at this time. And I offer also apologies for Mr. Troy Wickham, who is unavoidably delayed and will join us later. I've been asked to say a few words of welcome at this, the 11th time we have compiled and released a report of the Barbados Drug Information Network, Barden. I'm not going to go into too many details, I'll leave that to Mrs. Foster. But I want again to stress to all of you the importance of maintaining information such as this on an ongoing basis, given the wide and varied impacts of drug abuse on all sectors of society. As the information base is built, we get a better sense of the causes and consequences of drug use and addiction, and how to apply that knowledge to improve individual and public health outcomes. We know, we know drug, people use drugs for a lot of different reasons. And when I say drugs, I mean drugs including alcohol for different reasons. Some of these include relaxation, enjoyment, peer pressure, out of curiosity, pure rebellion. They're used to relieve stress, overcome boredom, cope with problems. But here's the challenge. When persons start using substances, they do so because of the perceived benefits and not because of the potential harm. This is important in crafting a different response to persons who unfortunately fall victims to substance misuse. And so for us, in prevention or demand reduction, information disseminated here today can be used to identify reasons for use in the first place and help us in developing and testing new approaches to treatment and prevention. For those on the supply reduction and law enforcement criminal justice side, this data can help to identify trends in the traditional illicit drug market, as well as keep us on the cutting edge of new developments regarding the diversion of chemical substances with legitimate industrial applications, which can then be diverted from the illicit trade and used to manufacture illicit drugs. You will hear more from us in the coming months on this whole business of these new psychoactive drugs as we go forward. So as I close my very brief remarks, 
I wish to reiterate that perhaps what is needed for the future if we are to make any lasting change in this whole issue of illicit drug use, it's really not a choice between law enforcement or treatment, but rather we need to review or create new policies that unite law enforcement and the criminal justice agencies and treatment and prevention agencies to work together more effectively over long periods of time. Finally, I do hope that we each in our respective agencies continue to make use of the presentation today and continue to forge alliances so that we can realize a steady reduction in illicit drug use, both at individual and societal levels. I do wish you a productive evening. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Hunt, for those insightful words, and certainly to welcome all of you here to the National Council on Substance Abuse. And of course, this is our month, our annual Drug Awareness Month, uh, and this forms our last activity, official activity, for the month uh, of celebration. And certainly it is a pleasure as your moderator this afternoon, and as a substance abuse prevention officer, to have the privilege to now introduce our leader in this fight, the Honorable Wilfred Abrams, Member of Parliament and Minister of Home Affairs and Information, who will now deliver remarks. Minister. Good afternoon, everybody. Technology is something else. Uh, I had it upside down. <laughs> we cooking with gas now. DPS, members of the Board of Management and the staff of the National Council of Substance Abuse, has department, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, and all who are watching us either live or tape delayed. A pleasant good afternoon to you all. A pleasant good afternoon to you all. Thank you. It's with great pleasure that I deliver these remarks at this meeting of the Barbados Drug Information Network, Barden, convened to highlight the key findings from the 2021 Barden Report. As you know, Barden is a tool used by the NCSA to monitor the local drug situation. And through the publication of annual reports, it continues to be a critical source of valid and reliable information for both government and key stakeholders as we work together to deliver and develop a national response to the drug problem. The 2021 report is the 11th in the Barden series and, there and therefore provides an excellent opportunity for trend analysis. It points to a situation that remains largely unchained with traditional drugs such as alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine continuing to be dominant. While this may be so, it also shows that though less common, non-traditional substances, primarily ecstasy and met, I always stumble over this word, and meth, <laughs> are present on our island, and this is a cause for concern. This report will also show that young people, particularly those aged 40 and under, are most likely to be involved in the drug situation, either as treatment seekers or drug offenders. And this has significant implications for our future as a country and for our workforce. Persons in this age group are in the prime of their productive years. And demographic data reflects that Barbados is a growing and aging population. Let us for a moment consider the impact which substance use and addiction can have on the workplace, both in terms of absenteeism, i.e. being physically absent from the workplace, as well as presenteeism, where persons are present, but their output is decreased due to impairment 
or hangover effects resulting from the use of psychoactive substances. Being intoxicated while on the job can affect attention, concentration, and judgment, which in turn can hinder productivity, accuracy, and efficiency. There's also the potential for accidents, as more often than not, when persons are intoxicated, their alertness, perception, and motor coordination are negatively affected, thereby reducing their ability to safely use machinery, make safety-sensitive decisions, and carry out tasks which require quick and accurate reflexes. This is significant, as it means that on-the-job intoxication can threaten the health and safety of all employees, not just the drug user. I digress a little bit. It is critical for employers to understand that they have a duty of care to all of the employees who are in their workforce. And if you know, or you should have known, or you should have had a reasonable cause to suspect that somebody is intoxicated on the job or using drugs and you do nothing, then it is actual knowledge at best, constructive knowledge, or negligence to the other members of your workforce. What does this mean? If I know, I was about to say if I know that Curtis, but Curtis, I have never even seen you almost behave badly, so let me not even pit you. If I know that person A, that's so every day to go and smoke weed. If I know, I don't do nothing because he's a reasonable worker and you cut him some slap because you want unfair fella. And person A is driving a forklift. And he comes back in when I know he's likely to be intoxicated or had I applied my mind to it, I should know that he does this every day and this is when he starts to slack off. And an accident occurs that somebody is injured or killed. I, as the employer, will find myself liable for the actions of that, not just on the basis of employer's liability, but you can even get aggravated damages and other things that follow, even to perhaps criminal negligence on the part of the employer. So this is serious. This is very serious. Employers and persons who work with persons who use drugs owe a duty of care to the other people to bring it to the attention of those who are in a position to make the decisions. It must not be tolerated in the workplace because the consequences are too severe. Even if the individual is not intoxicated while at work, their preoccupation with obtaining and using substances can also interfere with their attention and concentration. Likewise, the after effects of substance use can also be problematic. These include hangovers or even withdrawal, both of which lead to reduced productivity and increased absenteeism. Even more concerning, perhaps, is the potential overall economic costs of substance abuse to economies like ours, which are already stretched in the face of the recent natural and public health disasters. The workplace has a key role to play in addressing substance use issues as persons spend many of their waking hours at work. Therefore, it's incumbent upon employers to equip themselves with the requisite tools. These include workplace drug policies and employee assistance programs. It is also critical that both they and their staff are educated about the signs and symptoms of drug use. As the lead agency for demand reduction in Barbados, the NCSA is well-placed and well-equipped to assist in all of these areas. In fact, the Council has to date assisted a number of public and private sector organizations with the crafting of workplace drug policies and regularly delivers workplace drug education. I therefore encourage organizations to reach out to the NCSA for assistance in this regard and to make good use of the Council's considerable expertise in this area. In all that it does, the NCSA uses an evidence-based approach and its workplace interventions are no exception. In fact, in 2022, the Council conducted a workplace survey which will be used to guide such interventions going forward. Therefore, you can expect only excellence when you partner with the NCSA. 
Shameless plug there. <laughs> I'll say it again. Therefore, you can expect only excellence when you partner with the NCSA. <laughs> Big up yourself. <laughs> so I will close here. Or as we say in closing, usually that's probably the best part of a politician's speech. <laughs> Everybody waits to hear. You know, they say finally, or, or as the Prime Minister says, last point. But you know when they say in closing, it means it literally is in closing. So in closing. But before I do, I once again underscore the importance of research initiatives such as Barden. They help us to focus our efforts and our resources. And in keeping with the findings which I just shared, I challenge the NCSA and key stakeholders in the demand reduction of supply control sectors to make our young people a priority so as to safeguard our, work for, our workforce and the future of our society. I am assured by the Council that additional areas of concern will be explored to address trends rising from these findings. I also commend the NCSA, the Barbados Drug Information Network members, for their continued commitment to burden as these annual reports are an invaluable resource. That said, I wish you all a good and productive session and look forward to the presentations and discussions. Good luck. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for your words of encouragement. And certainly, uh, our management will continue to lead the cause and uh, ensure that we have evidence informing our programming and other activities. At this point, we are pleased to welcome the, our colleague and research an information officer with the National Council on Substance Abuse, Mrs. Laura Foster, who will now facilitate the presentation of the key findings of, from the Barden 2021 report. Ms. Foster. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Paula Vett. I'm just making a little space here. Um, so for today's presentation, I am going to start by giving some background information about Barden, uh, and then I'll jump straight into the 2021 report. Uh, and in doing, I will cover the agencies and departments which contributed to our report, uh, and then I'll present the key findings from the various areas as well as some trend analysis. Uh, and then I'll wrap up by touching on the issues which uh, we saw coming out of the data as well as some related recommendations. So what exactly is the Barbados Drug Information Network? And I know that most of you by now would be familiar uh, with Barden because as you heard today, this is our 11th report. So we would have had many of these presentations over the years, but I know that we have a few newcomers with us uh, and we also may have some persons joining us online who aren't familiar. So I thought that I would still include this uh, to give everyone uh, the same understanding. So Barden is the tool that Barbados uses to collect and disseminate information on the local drug situation. So that will include data from our prevention and our treatment as well as law enforcement sectors. And we do this by using various practical approaches to collect data from our stakeholders. And something to know about Barden is that it's based on what we call secondary data. So that simply means that we are collecting data that already exists from our stakeholders and we put it together to make our reports. Now, Barden is intended to provide current epidemiological and other information on substance abuse, as well as to identify trends in drug consumption and offenses related to illicit drugs, to strengthen the capacity of Barbados to respond to changing drug use trends, to provide relevant information for the planning, evaluation, and management of drug control programs, and to regularly update this information. Now, Barden has been around for quite a long time. It actually dates back to about 2003 when the NCSA first started uh, to pursue having a drug information network. And at that time, we were working closely with the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, uh, which is uh, a part of the Organization of American States. And we would have faced a number of challenges, particularly when it came to data collection. So we had a few stops and starts along the way. Uh, but when, uh, in 2011, what we did was we relaunched Barden, and we addressed at that time some 
some of the challenges that we were facing. And we were actually able then to, pr to produce our first report in January of 2013, and that would have been based on our 2011 data. And since then, we have been able to produce uh, annual reports for each calendar year. So as you heard, this is our 11th report. And what this has allowed us to do is to continuously monitor the drug situation. Now, we're always looking, ways, um, looking for ways to expand and to improve Barden. So in 2019, we introduced some standardized uh, data collection forms. We also added new indicators. We had two new contributing agencies join us. So that would be the Financial Intelligence Unit as well as the Criminal Justice Research and Planning Unit. And we introduced memoranda of understanding. And we did that in an effort to formalize our reporting obligations with our partner agencies. Uh, in 2022, we had the pleasure of welcoming the Government Industrial School back on board because they were one of our original partners when we started. Uh, and we're proud to say they have now been included in our last two reports, so one of which is the 2021 report, and we have uh, a representative here today. So we, we are happy to have them with us. At present, we have 10 active network members, and these include the National Council on Substance Abuse, the Edna Nichols Center, the Psychiatric Hospital, the Substance Abuse Foundation, the Center for Counseling Addiction Support Alternatives, or CASA, the Barbados Police Service, the Barbados Prison Service, the Government Industrial School, the Financial Intelligence Unit, and the Criminal Justice Research and Planning Unit. And you will find that some reports don't have all of the agencies included in them. And that's because from time to time, agencies will have you know, operational challenges or some difficulties collecting data for a particular year. So you will not always find all of them in, in each report. But nevertheless, Barden reports, they, they're important because they allow us to identify consistent patterns and changes in the local uh, drug situation. So we're talking about things like, you know, the available drugs, patterns of use, uh, also even something as simple as patterns in drug offenses. So we've been able to see that over the past decade. And this type of information is key because it feeds into what we call an evidence-based approach. Uh, which simply means that we use research findings to guide our policies and our programming. And we're living in an area where evidence base is considered to be the gold standard. So basically everything has that research foundation. It's no longer based on you know, a person's subjective assessment of a situation or what they think or feel may be best. Uh, so, so this is very important when it comes to Barden. Barden also has a number of other important functions. So for instance, it facilitates interagency cooperation and information sharing. Uh, it increases the data collection, presentation, and analysis skills of our contributing agencies, so it helps them to strengthen themselves. It also creates opportunities for that reliable and standardized data, which we know is important. And in so doing, that data allows us to better understand the drug situation. And when we do that, then another key feature of Barden is the fact that it creates the opportunity for a cohesive response. So as Betty said, for all of the different agencies working together in the, in the various sector, sectors. Now, you may ask yourself, how exactly can Barden data be used? And it can be used in a, in a variety of ways. So as I would have said, we have that evidence-based approach. So that said, we have seen Barden data used as supporting evidence for various programs and, and drug prevention um, initiatives. We've also seen it used in policy development one particular example is the Barbados National Anti-Drug Plan. Uh, it also gets used by persons doing academic research, so we see it cited within various peer-reviewed journals, and it's also an excellent source of statistics, so you'll find that international agencies such as the UN, ODC, and CCAD rely on our Barden reports for data. So now that we have that basic understanding of Barden, we're going to go ahead and look at the 2021 report. So in this particular report, you're going to find eight agencies. Uh, within the prevention and treatment sector, we're going to have the NCSA, the Edna Nichols Center, the Psychiatric Hospital, the Substance Abuse Foundation, and the Center for Counseling Addiction Support Alternatives. There are three supply control agencies represented, and those are the Barbados Police Service, the Government Industrial School, and the Criminal Justice Research and Planning Unit. Before I present the data, I just wanted to touch on one important note, and that is the impact which the COVID-19 pandemic had on our agencies, and by extension, our report. So you're going to see uh, 
that we had reduced numbers because the fact of the matter is that the 2021 report is the second in a burden series to be impacted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So you're going to have that shown in, in particularly in the demand reduction sector because you're going to see reduced numbers of persons uh, that those persons were able to reach. And also noticeable is going to be the absence of the inmate drug rehabilitation and counseling program. And that, if you remember, is due in part to the COVID outbreak that the prison experienced at the start of 2021. So as a result, a number of strict health and safety measures were put in place at the prison. And as a result of those measures, uh, then the IDRC program was not able to conduct uh, its sessions with, with the various inmates. So they are missing from this report. That said, now we're going we're gonna to jump straight in, uh, and as always, I'm going to start with the demand reduction sector, and I'm going to start with the NCSA in particular. So as you know, the NCSA is the lead agency responsible for drug prevention education in Barbados. So what that means is that we conduct programs at the school and community levels, but we also have a very active counseling program. And in 2021, we would have reached persons across the age, the age ranges. So you will see that the youngest person we actually interacted with during that year was seven, uh, but we saw persons upwards of 65 as well. Uh, some years we may even go as low as three years old. It all depends on, on our involvement in the schools as well at that time. Now, this particular chart shows us that during 2021, our community program had the greatest reach, followed by our school and our counseling programs. And this is a bit different than what we would normally see. Typically, we see our primary school program far outranking all of the others. Uh, but this simply is a reflection of the pandemic and that switch to online schooling. Um, and of course, that brought with it a myriad of challenges for all involved, including the schools themselves. Um, but that's not to say that we weren't responsive because at the NCSA, we did switch to online programming from the, from the inception of the pandemic. So we would be using things like Zoom, Nearpod and other online tools to help us reach persons where they were. But nevertheless, it, it still is a reflection of what was going on there. And also another note is with the primary school program during that year, uh, the officer responsible for primary schools was very much focused on, you know, transitioning her programs online as well. So that was something else that was going on. Okay, we're going to look now at the Edna Nichols Center. And I'm sure most of you know that this center provides rehabilitative programming for secondary school students who have been suspended or expelled from school. And students can be sent to the center for a maximum of two weeks at any given time. And all students are tested for cocaine and marijuana use on admission to the center. Now, in 2021, only 11 students were admitted to the center. And that's a very small number compared to what we've seen in the past. And again, this is a reflection of the pandemic, and particularly that switch to online schooling which took place. Now, the, of the 11 students, we found that five of them tested positive for marijuana use. So that's about 45.4%, and that's quite a high percentage. But that's not the type of percentages we normally see. We normally see like around 20% and, and those kind of percentages. But this is likely due to the fact that the percentage was calculated on a very small number. So we, we have to take that kind of with a grain of salt at, at this point. Um, but what we did see was, and this is in keeping with what we normally see, that the persons who tested positive were males uh, and they were between the ages of 13 and 15 years. So that is, that is quite typical. Uh, also typical is the fact that no students tested positive for cocaine. We don't ever find that. Uh, only once did, a, you know, in one year did a couple of students test positive, but typically it's about marijuana use for, for this particular population. Okay, so at this point now, we're gonna switch our attention to treatment in Barbados. Uh, and for these uh, slides, we'll be able to compare across the agencies for the year. So starting off with the demographic profile of our treatment seekers and particularly gender, you can see here that males far outnumber females in our treatment centers. Uh, and the distribution is quite similar across all the agencies. So between seven and eight out of every 10 persons seeking treatment were male during that year. And, and that, is quite, that is quite a typical finding. 
With regards to age, the vast majority of our treatment seekers were between the ages, were under, sorry, were under the age of 40. Uh, so again, that is about, let's say, maybe seven out of every 10 persons. And again, quite a typical finding. This slide here shows us the distribution of persons who were treated for single drug use versus poly drug use. And poly drug use simply means the use of multiple substances. Uh, while at the drug rehab unit at the psychiatric hospital and at CASA and the NCSA, most persons were treated for single drug use. The opposite was true at the Substance Abuse Foundation. And at that particular organization, almost eight out of every 10 persons were treated for, for the use of multiple substances. And this is quite an important finding because this will have implications for treatment planning, et cetera. Now, all persons who use drugs, regardless of whether or not they use multiple drugs or have a single drug uh, use disorder, they all will have a drug of choice, so that primary drug that will motivate their need for treatment. And as such, this slide shows us the primary drugs for which persons sought treatment during 2021. And we can see here that the most common primary drugs were alcohol, marijuana, and crack cocaine. However, a small percentage percentage of persons at the Substance Abuse Foundation also reported cocaine powder and benzodiazepines as their primary drug of choice. Now that brings us to the end of our demand reduction sector. So at this point we're going to turn over to the supply reduction section and we're going to have a look first at data coming from the Barbados Police uh, Service. So what we see here is that of the 5,392 offenses recorded by the police in 2021, 18% or just under two in 10 uh, were for drug related offenses. And again, this is quite a common uh, percentage. So nothing out of the ordinary here. When we consider the demographic profile of drug offenders, we find that they tend to be male and they also tend to be under the age of 40. So again, that is lining up with what we're seeing in our treatment centers. So that, that 40 and under age category tends to be uh, somewhat of a problematic one. Also, when we looked at the offenses by drug type, we can see here that about nine out of every 10 offenses on record were cannabis related. There were notably fewer cocaine related offenses and offenses related to methamphetamine and ecstasy. Now, while those methamphetamine and ecstasy related offenses are very few in number, they're still important because they're showing us that these substances are uh, present on island. So they are very important nonetheless. When I also had a look at the specific offenses within each drug category, I, I looked at the comparison of possession to all of the other offenses. And what we found is that possession tended to be the single largest offense within each drug category. And that is, again, quite a common finding. And it's most likely due to the fact that possession tends to be what they call a predicate offense. So that means that it typically will accompany more serious offenses. So things like trafficking and, and intent to supply, et cetera. So, that's not unusual, and it also was the case across all of the substances on record for that year. In terms of our drug seizures, cannabis was the most commonly seized substance, and it was seized in compressed, loose, and plant form. Uh, there were also a few seizures of cocaine and ecstasy. And again, I've highlighted the ecstasy seizures, because even though they are few in number, they are pointing to the presence of that substance on island. In terms of the locations where drugs were seized, we can see that quite a number of locations were identified. Uh, however, courier services, dwelling houses, bushy areas, streets, and the airport were actually the most common. And together, those accounted for about 80% of our, our drug seizures that year. With regards to the marijuana plant seizures in particular, you can see here that seizures took place across all 11 parishes. However, about two thirds of our seizures took place within St. Joseph and St. John. All right, so now we're gonna change gears again. And at this point, we're gonna look at some uh, 
offense data that was rec recorded by the Criminal Justice Research and Planning Unit and specifically the sentence outcomes uh, for various drug offenders. And this data was taken from the magistrate's courts in Barbados. So here you can see that the majority of persons who were sentenced in our mag magistrate's courts for drug offenses were actually involved uh, in cannabis-related offenses. So that lines up with what we saw coming from the police where most of the offenses or the charges taking place were cannabis-related. There were fewer cocaine um, offenses being tried within our courts and there was one person who was tried for a methamphetamine related offenses. Uh, but again, we point them out because that is highlighting the presence of this drug as well. What I did here was I pulled out the top three sentence outcomes for the top three offenses within each drug type. So you can see that within cannabis offenses, possession, trafficking, and intent to supply were the most common. Uh, and those tried for possession were most likely to, to be convicted, reprimanded, and discharged. While those tried for trafficking and intent to supply were most likely to be reprimanded and discharged. Now uh, within the cocaine uh, offenses, trafficking, intent to supply, and possession of apparatus were the most common, uh, and those charged with trafficking and intent to supply were most likely to, to be convicted, reprimanded, and discharged, while imprisonment was the most likely outcome for those uh, who possessed apparatus, though there were a few persons who received a CRD um, as well. Now, in terms of methamphetamine, that one person that we saw before, they were charged and tried for both possession and intent to supply. And for the possession charge, they received a bond, and for intent to supply, they were reprimanded and discharged. In addition to the cannabis, cocaine, and methamphetamine-related uh, cases in the courts, there were also a number of other cases involving controlled drugs that were not identified, and 95% of these were related to possession, intent to supply, and trafficking. And in each case, po persons were most likely to have been reprimanded and discharged. Our last set of data for 2021 that we're going to look at comes from the Government Industrial School. And during that year, there were 52 offenses for which wards were either re remanded or committed to the school. And two of these 52 were drug-related. And both involved possession of a controlled substance, and in each case, that substance was marijuana. And both of the wards charged with this offense were 15-year-old males. Now, on occasion, the judge presiding or the magistrate presiding over a wards case will request that they be drug tested. And in 2021, 10 wards were tested and three of them tested positive for marijuana use. All three were male, two were 15 and one was 14. So again, it's lining up closely with, with the test results that we're seeing coming from the Edna Nichols Center. Uh, similarly, there were no wards who tested positive for cocaine use. Now, as I said earlier, one of the most powerful attributes or key features of Barden is the fact that it allows us to monitor the drug situation. So a presentation like this would not be complete if I didn't do you know, some trend analysis and show you some of what we've been seeing. So I'll start with the Edna Nichols Center. And this chart shows us the number of students that were admitted between 2017 and 2021. And what you can see here is that there was a steady increase of admissions between 2017 and 2019. But with the onset of the pandemic, so right there at 2020, we had a sharp decline. And then yet again, another decline in 2021. So most likely we can attribute this to the, the online schooling and the various uh, restrictions and so on that were put in place with the pandemic. In terms of the percentage of students testing positive for marijuana use in that five-year period, you can see that pre-COVID, the numbers are pretty much holding steady. So remember I told you that they were kind of around 20%. That's usually what we see. Uh, but in 2020, that dropped down to 14.5. And then we saw that sharp increase to 45.4 in 2021. Again, the changes in these last two years are most likely due to peculiar peculiarities surrounding the pandemic. 
So if we cast our memories back to 2020, we had a lot of lockdowns. We also had a lot of curfews and those more likely than not would have restricted access to, to drugs, including marijuana. So that may be why we saw a reduction there. And then again, as I said, uh, that large percentage for 2021 is most likely related to the small number on which the percentage was calculated. In terms of the profile of persons testing positive for marijuana use at the center, uh, during the five-year period, we can see that it is typically males. So for that first three years, the males outnumbered females, and then in 2020 and 2021, only males tested positive. In terms of age, we typically are seeing that it's the 14 to 15 year olds who are testing positive. And we can see that, that there was actually an increase in 14 year olds in 2020 and 2021. But again, we can't say for certain this may have something to do with the data and the calculations because of, of the reduced numbers due to COVID. So we'll watch that going forward. Now, we're gonna look at treatment data and it's gonna it's going to be for three years, so 2019 through 2021. I wasn't able to do a five-year period due to the availability of data going backwards, um, but I was glad that we finally had three consecutive years that we can start to look at something. Uh, and what we can see here is that since the onset of COVID, we've had a steady decline in persons who were seeking treatment um, for for substance use disorders. And again, this is likely due to the changes in operations and so on that, that took place, but we're gonna talk about that again in a little bit. In terms of the persons seeking treatment, they are typically male. So again, we can see that, and by the way, this is all of our agencies combined. So this is, this is everyone seeking treatment during this three year period. And you can see that across all of the three years, uh, you're looking that about eight, between eight and nine of every 10 persons seeking treatment was male. Uh, again, with our age, we can see that it, it remains that, that 40 and under age category that we have to, to consider because they're the ones who are primarily seeking treatment. And in terms of poly drug use and single drug use, this slide shows us that poly drug use is a very real phenomenon here in Barbados. And it, actually our numbers are, appear to be growing. So. In 2019, we would have seen that about a quarter of persons seeking treatment were treated for the use of multiple substances. But by the time we get to 2020 and 2021, uh, the numbers of persons seeking treatment for, for multiple substances is about equal or even surpassing our single drug use. But again, we can't deny the fact that this coincides with COVID. So we can't be certain if, if this is a reflection of that or we will watch this going forward as well. This chart here shows us the percentage of persons with comorbid diagnoses, including substance use disorders at the psychiatric hospital in 2021, between 2018 and, sorry, as between 2018 and 2021. Now a comorbid diagnosis simply means that they have both a mental health disorder as well as a substance use disorder. And what we can see here is that the numbers pretty much held steady during that four year period with the exception of the slight increase in 2019. So we can say that between about one fifth and one quarter of the persons who are admitted to the psychiatric hospital actually have both mental health and substance use disorders. And again, this is very important when it comes to treatment planning and treatment provision uh, because persons who have multiple diagnoses need to be treated for all of them in order to do well. Switching to the police now, and uh, we're looking here at the profile of persons who were charged for drug offenses during the five year period of 2017 through 2019. Uh, we can see again, it's typically males who are charged uh, and it's typically those who are under the age of 40. So this, this held steady across all of the five years, not just what we saw for 2021. The drug offenses here by drug type show us, again, a similar picture to what we saw for 2021 with cannabis being uh, you, you know, the substance that really captures the attention of law enforcement officials. But if we look a bit more closely at 2017, 2019, 2020, and 2021, these years show us some of those non-traditional substances again. So we're gonna see data regarding uh, offenses that include ecstasy and methamphetamine. Uh, and in 2019, there's a very small percentage, 0.1% that involved alprazolam as well. 
Now, what I've done here is I've focused on the distribution of cannabis offenses between 2017 and 2021. And I did this for two reasons. One, because of course we saw that cannabis took the lion's share of the offenses, but also we had a number of legislative changes related to cannabis in 2019 and 2021. So specifically, we had the enactment of the Sacramental and Medicinal Cannabis Acts in 2019. And then in 2021, we had the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Amendment Act that was passed, which removed uh, criminal penalties for the possession of 14 grams or less of marijuana. So I wanted to see what would happen. Did it, did it have any effect on the data? And at first glance, what we notice here is that, again, possession was the most common offense across all of the years. But from 2019 onwards, we start to see a reduction in the percentage of persons who were charged with possession. Simultaneously, we are seeing an increase in the number of persons charged with more serious offenses, so such as trafficking and offering to supply. So this seems to coincide with those legislative changes. Uh, and it may be a reflection of the fact that there are fewer persons being charged now with small scale possession as opposed to before the legislative legislation was changed. This slide here also seems to support that observation. So this particular set of data is related to the number of possession cases that were adjudicated within the magistrate's courts in 2019 and then again in 2021. So it's not a true trend analysis because 2020 data wasn't available for inclusion, but I thought it still offered us a really good comparison. And what we can see is that there was a sharp decline in the number of cases related to possession within our courts. So that actually amounts to a reduction of about 71%. So it's quite, quite a high re um, reduction. And this will line up very closely with that um, change to the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. So that removal of the criminal penalties, okay? Now, that was my last data slide. So what we're gonna do at this point is we're gonna look at some of the issues that seem to be coming out of the data. Uh, and then what I'll do is pose a number of uh, related recommendations as we go. Now, I wanna go right back to what I was just talking about. So that whole issue of the changing legislation and the potential impact that it's having. So as we saw, there was a decrease in the number of persons being charged, as well as tried for marijuana possession. So this will translate into a reduced load on the penal system, but it also will then mean that that will bring with it lower costs, and in that includes lower costs when it comes to incarceration in, in cases of where persons receive a custodial sentence. So of course, that is definitely an advantage both uh, judicially as well as economically. Now, at the individual level, we know that persons with a criminal record, they tend to be stigmatized. So as a result, they tend to have you know, difficulties getting employment, they tend to have difficulties getting travel visas, and they face other forms of discrimination as well. So for them, avoiding a criminal charge is going to be a plus, but that is not the be all and the end all. We need to make sure that persons who are dependent on the substance can receive the help that is needed. And I think a lot of it has to do with the approach that's taken. So if we look at Portugal uh, as an example, they were actually the first country to decriminalize uh, the possession of small amounts of all illicit drugs, including marijuana. But to date, they have not recorded any increases in drug use. Instead, they have seen decreases uh, in problematic use, decreases in adolescent use, and they've also seen decreases in the health harms and social issues associated with drug use. And their success is likely due to the approach which they took. So when they removed their criminal penalties, they simultaneously increased their treatment and their harm reduction approaches as well. So that is what likely has them in good stead. Now, the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Amendment Act of 2020, in addition to removing the criminal penalties for uh, the possession of 14 grams or less of marijuana, also makes provision for persons to be uh, referred to the NCSA for assessment and counseling. But 
while we're seeing that decrease in persons who are being charged, we're not seeing an increase in persons coming to the NCSA. So what that means for us is that we need to start to talk to the key stakeholders. We need to figure out what's going on because it's important for us to make sure that everything is in place so that persons can be diverted to the NCSA as the law intends. So we're gonna need to have those discussions with everyone. Now, in addition to doing that, we also need to, to monitor the impact of the, the changing legislation on marijuana use at the national level. So we're going to need to do some research on that. And the international and regional studies have shown uh, mixed results. So some have shown that there is a relationship between relaxed marijuana laws and marijuana use, while others show that there is no relationship. So what we need to do is figure out exactly what's going on here on the ground in Barbados because that type of data is going to feed into that evidence-based approach which I spoke about earlier. So it's going to help to guide our programming and our policy development. Now the NCSA, we are planning a secondary school survey, so that's going to be our fourth survey and we are hoping that we can get that off the ground before the end of the academic year. And it should help us to partially address the data gap. But we need to do more. So we need to do some more surveys, so nationally representative ones. Uh, but we also can do some qualitative research. We can also use some rapid assessment studies so we can get speedy results on certain things as well. And we can focus you know, on, yes, the national population, but we can also focus on adolescents and other, you know, other special groups, other persons who may be at risk as well. Another important issue that we need to talk about is the reduced treatment uptake, which we saw. So remember, we would have seen in the slide that since the onset of COVID, there was a steady decline in persons who were going in for substance abuse treatment. Now, anecdotal reports suggest that this has nothing to do with a reduced need for treatment. Rather, it's more a reflection of operational changes which resulted from the restrictions that were in place. And this is concerning because we know that substance use is associated with various social and health issues. So we're talking about things like the increased risk for disease, both infectious and non-communicable, you know, the increased risk for homelessness, crime, those sorts of things. And these are issues which can affect the individuals as well as their families and the society at large. There are also things that can threaten our public health and our public safety. And as such, they will ultimately lead to increased government expenditure on health care and social support, as well as crime prevention and the penal system. On the flip side of that, we see research which shows that for every dollar spent in treatment, between four and seven dollars is saved on health care costs. Likewise, for every dollar spent in treatment, upwards of $7 is saved on law enforcement costs. So again, this really shows us that we need to put a focus on treatment and we need to work towards getting our numbers back to where they used to be. So at least get back to those pre-COVID levels, uh, if not surpassing them. And one of the ways to do that is by identifying and addressing the barriers to treatment. Now, there are a number of traditional barriers which exist, and these include things like a perceived lack of need for treatment, fear of stigmatization, privacy concerns, etc. But here in Barbados, we have one uh, that one potential barrier which may be related actually to the psychiatric hospital's role within treatment, both as an outpatient treatment provider as well as, as the clearing house for residential treatment in Barbados. So as the latter, what that means is that persons who want to have their treatment sponsored by the government, so their residential treatment, they must present to the psychiatric hospital for assessment and referral to the Substance Abuse Foundation. Now we know that there is actually a lot of stigma associated with the psychiatric hospital here in Barbados. So as a result, persons are often hesitant to go to that institution, even if it is simply for assessment or simply for outpatient counseling. So what I am suggesting is that the psychiatric hospital may consider relocating their drug rehab unit so that it's not on the hospital compound. Uh, and I'm also suggesting that the assessment and referral process for residential treatment be decentralized. And I see both of these recommendations as not only reducing the impact which stigma can have on uh, treatment seeking, but it can also help to make treatment easier to access for persons who need it. 
And another important and powerful barrier is lack of knowledge. So if persons don't know about addiction and they don't know what treatment options exist, et cetera, they, you know, they're less likely to be able to seek or, or receive treatment. So I'm also suggesting that we engage in a public education campaign which seeks to address this particular barrier. So we're talking about messaging which will focus on what addiction is, who may be affected, uh, as well as where persons can get help. And it's also very important that the messaging focuses on destigmatizing uh, addiction as well. And we can meet persons where they're at. So we can use social media, we can use traditional media, we can use a variety variety of, of methods, but the important thing is to get the messaging out there. Again, we saw that young people continue to dominate our drug situation. So, you know, this is concerning because as we would have heard uh, the minister say, we have an aging population. These persons are also in the prime of their productive years. And in fact, data shows that this age group accounts for about half or just over half of our workforce. So when we, when we look at that against the backdrop of the aging population, we actually have something to be concerned about because this, this you know, it, it almost makes our social and economic out, outlook a bit bleak. So we need to consider what we can do to reduce this population's involvement within the drug situation. And that said, I, you know, I recommend that our professionals in prevention, treatment and re rehabilitation, that they increase their focus on persons in the 40 and under age category. And in so doing, they should use evidence-based approaches which meet the specific needs of this population. So they will use things that they know will be effective when they do so. I also suggest that the Barbados population policy which is being developed include the areas of prevention, treatment and rehabilitation. So when I saw the last draft, these areas were not included, but I think it would be important if it speaks to the delivery of drug prevention education and other drug prevention initiatives, uh, also increasing the availability of and access to treatment for drug use disorders and the provision of rehabilitation and diversion programs for drug offenders. So a range of things it should include. Now I want to note that these particular recommendations that I have made actually coincide with our sustainable development goals, particularly goal three and target 3.5. So goal three speaks to ensuring healthy lives and promoting the well-being for all at all ages. And target 3.5 specifically speaks to strengthening the prevention and treatment of substance abuse. And these are important because, of course, health is critical to the development of a prosperous society, and that's what we want for Barbados. And lastly, I want to touch on the certification of prevention and treatment professionals, because certification is another way that we can seek to strengthen our prevention and treatment initiatives here in Barbados. And certification as a whole is important because it safeguards the quality of services that are offered because it ensures that our professionals, you know, that they meet minimum requirements and that they maintain their competence uh, in their respective areas, particularly through continuing education. And certification is particularly important because we're seeing those numbers of persons who have comorbid diagnoses, persons who have, you know, polysubstance use, and these persons will need specialized treatment, and that therefore requires specialized training. Now at present, we don't have any certification requirements in Barbados, so therefore there is no certification process either. So I'm recommending that a certification board be established, uh, and that this board be responsible for identifying and enforcing the certification requirements for both prevention and treatment in Barbados. And I'm also suggesting that the board uh, mandate continuing education as well as re-registration periodically to ensure that persons maintain, uh, maintain their competence. Again, establishing this board will align with target 3.5 of the SDGs, but it also will do something else. It's going to address an area of concern that the Organization of American States expressed uh, in its 2021 assessment of Barbados's prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. So that's something that would have come out of our multilateral evaluation mechanism report. So it will help in that regard as well. 
Now, that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I know I've given you a lot to think about. I know you're glad to, to hear me come to the end. But I wanted to take this opportunity also uh, to address an ongoing challenge that we're having with Barden. So since Barden was relaunched in 2011, we have seen it plagued by late submission as well as non-submission of data from our contributing agencies. And these two things, they hinder our report preparation, particularly the timely preparation of our reports as well as the timely distribution of our findings. And this is a, a, a very significant shortcoming because we need current data to be you know, to feed into our, our evidence-based approach. So we, we do need it to come in in a timely manner in order to develop that national response which we spoke about. So that said, I want to you know, urge all of our partners who are here as well as those who are joining us online to work with us to address this shortcoming as we go forward so that we can try to you know, bring our, our reporting as up to date as possible. So I know right now this is actually pretty good for us in January of 2023 to be releasing 2021, uh, but I would like to, to be in a position to release 2022 before the end of 2023 if we can. So I urge you all to work with us. Uh, and that brings me to the end of our presentation. So I thank you all for staying the course and staying awake. Um, and I'm going to hand you back over to Ms. Atkinson at this point. Um, Ms. Atkinson. Thank you, Ms. Foster, for our most insightful and comprehensive report and also for those recommendations. Um, I must say that prior to, the minister has to take leave, but prior to his leave, uh, minister, if there are any salient comments that you wish to make prior to making your departure, we'd invite you to do so now. Thank you. I am exceedingly pleased by, I'm exceedingly pleased by this report, and I agree with you. For the report to make sense, the data must be contemporaneous. So it makes no sense analyzing three years ago trends to address the current situation. We need to have the data a bit more relevant. That way we have a better chance of providing the remedies that actually deal with the situation that we're facing at a particular time. Now, I want to congratulate, congratulate the National Council on Substance Abuse and those who prepared the Barden report. A lot of other territories in the Caribbean proceed on anecdotal evidence. <clears throat> you assume that marijuana is the drug of choice because everybody knows about weed. People smoke weed openly, but people will hide and do cocaine, or hide and do crack, or hide, hide and do methamphetamines. <laughs> my people, my people. But it is one thing to proceed on what you assume is actually the fact. It is another thing to be proceeding with the confidence of having the evidence in front of you that you can justify the decisions that you're taking, that you can have an evidence-based approach that can stand up to scrutiny and help inform practical policies by both the drug prevention and control agencies, as well as the government, in deciding what funds to allocate to advance it. So all that being said, I do as well hope, and I challenge you, I challenge you to actually put out a 2022 um, report before the end of 2023. And Curtis, for those agencies that fall under us that are tardy with their reporting, then we, we're all under one ministry. We need to do the things that we need to do to ensure that the National Council on Substance Abuse has the evidence and has what it needs to produce its reports and inform its policies. They can't do it by themselves. So the ministry has to take a leading part in dealing with that, ensuring that they get the information. Um, I'm glad to see the numbers. I'm glad to be in a position to actually tell the Prime Minister and show the Prime Minister report and say, look, this is what we're dealing with now. I am glad that we're in a position to actually tell the police, you need to now start to be on the lookout for these things. This is what they look like. And if we can actually pre-warn them that these are the consequences when these drugs creep in to a society, 
you're not just dealing with this person and this reaction, but you're dealing with some things a lot more extreme. So all in all, the fact that it is there in black and white, the fact that it is there, the proof of the pudding is in eating, the fact that it is there not as a suggestion, not as a theory, but as a fact to inform decisions and policies um, stands us in very good stead for this year. So I congratulate you entirely on the work that went into producing this. And we as a government, um, those of us in law enforcement, and I put on my attorney general hat today because I'm still the attorney general for another couple of hours, <laughs> right? Um, the, the police service can make very good use of this. I just will clarify one other thing um, that you said. Possession simplicity is, you call it small scale possession, small scale possession. We in the legal fraternity call it simple possession. So when you have a negligible amount of the drug that doesn't cross a certain threshold, we call that simple possession. The simple possession went out entirely, right, with um, the, the limits that are allowable under the legislation. So what you're getting now when you see possession is possession as a fact, so the more serious aspects of possession. But your numbers have come down. We call all of these simple possession ones now are, are gone. They don't bother to charge. The police will take it away, tear it up, throw it on the ground. I actually saw a man, the police took it away, tore it up, throw it on the ground, and walked off. And I saw a man picking it in pieces. I actually saw it on my own two eyes. Right? So that would explain some of those results. But congratulations. It was a lot of hard work. It was exceedingly well presented in a format that can be easily understood, digested, and used. So I encourage you to make good use of it. Thank you. Sorry. Any questions from the press? Nope, good, thanks. We crave the minister's indulgence. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Manager Hunt and our PR consultant, Ms. Roberts, to make a small presentation on behalf of the board and management of the National Council on Substance Abuse. You all embarrass me because I'm bringing them for you. <laughs> My mother always told me when you think you can get a gift, you should walk with one too. Thank you, Minister, and thank you all for your indulgence as well. Uh, certainly, this is Drug Awareness Month, albeit the last day of our month of activities for 2023. But we have as our theme this year, our workplace, our future, our future, our workplace. And therefore, that continued collaboration is key in addressing matters related to the workplace and preventing substance abuse. And therefore, it is a pleasure to have with us this evening to make a presentation on substance abuse in the workplace. Our colleague and uh, friend, she is also a mental health and family therapist who will now present. Please welcome Ms. Sharon Moaz. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. I'm going to talk to you today about expanding your perception around substance use in the workplace. Why it is happening, the cascade of events we are now experiencing. In fact, the future is now. And finally, what we can do about it. 
I want to tell you also a couple of stories that fundamentally changed my work as a mental health therapist as I work with individuals and couples and families and employees. And it also changed the way that I connect and support and serve my clients as a relationship coach. In fact, it changed my life profoundly, my personal life. Okay. At the root of all substance use and addiction is pain. Eckhart Tolle says, every addiction starts with pain and ends with pain. When we hear about substance use in the workplace, we don't readily think of addiction. We don't think that addiction may be present. But if your use is adversely affecting your work to the extent that it has been brought to your attention, perhaps you're slipping and not meeting your targets or your deadlines. It's also impacting um, you behaviorally um, ex so that people outside of you can see. You're moody, easily angered, forgetful, not present. You may even be drunk or high. Then, and you're in real danger of losing your job then the storms of addiction is already building. The dark clouds and the winds of trouble are already swirling, and it is only a matter of time. We don't often want to think about it that way, but I want to invite you to open your mind and to the possibility that we are living in a society where pain and trauma is so pervasive that use and misuse of any su substance that can alter our mind or our mood is all but inevitable left unchecked. I worked in a drug rehab for a number of years and I worked mostly with women in addiction. And here are two stunningly important lessons that I learned. Number one, every single woman that I worked with as a client was either emotionally, mentally, or physically abused, or all of them. And more often than not, that abuse occurred in her childhood. There was also chronic rejection or abandonment by a parental figure. Every woman. And this is true for men as well. Let that sink in. Number two, her use and dependency started in response to overwhelming pain and trauma. Pain she did not have the capacity to deal with. And frankly, none of us do at three or four or nine or 12. If you've ever felt pain in your life, then you can re relate to the story of Sherry. She was 24 and a mother of three. Her mother died of cancer when she was five years old. She has vague memories of her mother, but she could distinctly remember the acute loneliness of her childhood. She never knew her father, and she was raised by a grandmother who was very hard on her. She remembered that most of her life, she, was, she just felt unloved and unlovable and alone until she found marijuana at age 13, which made her feel so good. Like her loneliness wasn't so lonely after all. She thought, this is cool, right? But Sherry didn't do well at school. She, le she left with no qualification. She attended her graduation, but she was barely there. She was present, but mentally, emotionally, she was barely there. She smoked before and after her ceremony. In fact, she was already checked out. 
Then in a few years, Sherry was introduced to cocaine from her boyfriend. And the first time she tried it, she, know for, she knew for sure that she had finally found love and belonging. The kind that her heart had been aching for for her entire life. This was it. In her words, the first time that she tried cocaine was like the hug that she never received from her mother. Imagine for a moment how powerfully profound and deep that experience would have been. Eventually, Sherry lost her job, moved away from her friends. She lost her health. She even lost her children. That time in her life was littered by more pain, more trauma, and more abuse. We may see this as a choice that she made, but this really was her response to her overwhelming pain, trauma, and confusion. She never felt loved. She always felt invisible and unwanted. This was the only way that she knew how to deal with her reality. This was her, her escape. Let me just say that not every person who has ever experienced pain and childhood trauma will use a substance. But every person who has a substance use disorder and is addicted has pain and significant trauma. So why do people use? Why do people become addicted? According to Gabor Mate, the renowned addictions expert, author, and speaker, and I quote, people have deep emotional problems they don't have the capacity to solve. It is important that I tell you Sherry's story because as I outlined the signs and sub symptoms of substance use in the workplace and what employers can do about it, I want you to remember that at the root of all substance use and addiction is pain. And I want to, to say this um, because it was mentioned earlier um, about uh, the percentage of men versus women who are using substances. For every one man who is addicted, there are four or five women that he has introduced to his drug of choice. Sherry was one woman, one such woman. Substance use among adults 40 years and under can have a significant impact on the workplace. It can lead to decreased productivity, increased accidents and injuries, and it can also affect the health and well-being of the individual and other employees. Substance use can also have a negative impact on morale and team dynamics because he or she is not present in their own lives, so they cannot be present for or with their colleagues. It can lead to increased absenteeism and employee turnover because your job only serves to support your route to escape. What can employers do about it? First, I want to say caring, compassionate connection is important. Caring, compassionate connection must guide every policy and enforcement of that policy. But if you don't know what you should care about or you don't know what to care about, if you don't know or believe that at the root of all substance use and addiction is pain, if you believe that it is a choice or a moral failing, then I can understand the frustration, confusion, and anger. But it is neither of these things. So I would like to suggest that one of the most important steps that employees can do is to provide employee assistance programs, EAPs, and other resources to support employees struggling with substance use. EAPs can provide confidential counseling, referral services, and education on substance use and its effect in the workplace. Now beyond that, I am suggesting another important step, a critical step that employers can take. 
which is to intentionally create and promote a culture of health and well-being in the workplace. Through prioritizing the mental and emotional wellness of their staff and engaging employee wellness programs, which would encourage healthy coping strategies such as exercise and mindfulness, visioning for personal growth, emotional wellness, relationship skills, conflict re resolution skills, effective communication skills, work-life balance skills, etc. These all can help to reduce stress and overwhelm, provide personal coping strategies which, can, which then prevents or addresses the substance use. Managers and supervisors also play a crucial role in addressing substance use in the workplace. They should be trained to recognize the signs of substance use and to skillfully, with care, no judgment, provide support for employees who are struggling with substance use. However, it should be noted that no matter how well the supervisor or employer has been trained, it is not the role, or it is not their role to diagnose a possible substance use or dependency problem. Their role is to identify if a, an employee is, is impaired or may be exhibiting signs and symptoms that suggest drug use or substance use and to take the appropriate steps as per the organization's policy, which means that there has to be a policy. Some employers have done well with this. However, very often there is either no policy or there is a policy that is either outdated or not enforced because these courageous conversations are avoided until there has been a serious breach and it is too late and the only possible course of action is termination. In the case where the employee can be referred to an external service provider, the employer and employee has three options in this case. Seek leave, sorry, the employer can offer the employee sick leave, pay, sick leave where the payment will be issued through NIS. The other option is leave with pay from the employer or the employee enters treatment through the government, which then means that the employee has to go through the psychiatric hospital to be assessed and then they will be referred to a service provider where they will be then assessed and then entered into treatment. I wanna share a success story. Akeem came to work drunk most days and it was particularly evident on Mondays, Mondays after a weekend drinking binge. Mr. Hurdle, his boss, realized that Akeem had a drinking problem and finally had that courageous conversation. Akeem was given an ultimatum, get help or we'll be forced to let you go. As a last resort, Akeem consented to go to Verdon House. And by the way, as I share, Names and details have been changed. He consented to go to Verdon House for treatment. The company paid for his expenses. So he was on leave with pay. He spent 90 days in primary care at Verdon. At the end of the 90 days, Substance Abuse Foundation wrote a report stating that Akeem was fit to return to work and he did so. No repercussions no judgment. This is possible and actually happens when employers are invested in the employee and can afford to do so because not every company or business can afford this. It's not the behavior that needs to change. It's the person themselves that need to change. What does that mean? The focus has to be on the person and not the problem. The greatest damage done by neglect, trauma, or emotional loss is not the immediate pain they inflict, but the long-term distortions they induce in the way a developing child can continue to interpret the world and her situation in it. That, was, that quote was by Dr. Gabor Mate. This is the new paradigm. This is what chronic rejection and abandonment looks like in today's world. 
I love this quote by Deepak Chopra. He says, fear is the memory of pain. Addiction is the memory of pleasure. Freedom is beyond both. And Sharon Mose says, freedom is within our grasp. We hold the keys to this freedom for the next generation. We have the power to change the future. The future is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mawaz, for sharing. And as you would have stated, we have the power to change the future, and the future is now. Thank you for that very, it, it, was, it was a more experiential uh, approach to understanding substance use in the workplace and advocating to employers that they too need to be educated and understand the, the root causes of why people use and how best we can work together with the appropriate support and trained persons to prevent substance use in the workplace. So thank you so much. Uh, we have, as per our agenda, a question and answer session, but as was um, indicated earlier, uh, there are no questions at this point from the media. And therefore, it is a pleasure now to invite Dr. Ronald Chase, he is a member of the Board of, Man of Directors of the National Council on Substance Abuse, and he also wears a dual hat in that he is the Senior Registrar with the Psychiatric Hospital. Please welcome Dr. Chase as he delivers closing remarks. Good evening, everyone. Everyone is looking so bright and energetic and enthused and motivated with the information that was shared today. It was a big collaborative effort by all of you present, stakeholders present, in person and virtually. It could not be possible without your input and your data. We heard of the results of the, or your data collection. We heard of the impact that COVID, the COVID pandemic had on persons seeking treatment, even in the prevention programs. We heard about the concerns that the data shows us for our children and our future. We were also charged by Ms. Foster the, for, with some recommendations and some thoughts for consideration in terms of with the changing of legislation and the education that needs to go with it. That our children are at most at risk with drug use as the data from this report has shown and we are looking forward for the data from our fourth secondary school survey. I would echo with Minister and with Ms. Foster. And this is wearing the hat of the chairman of the projects and finance subcommittee that we would urge everyone, because you are the stakeholders of this product and your participation and timely participation allows us to deliver the information back to you guys to inform us of how to change our practices, what we need to look at, and to improve our product to the public of Barbados. It is not a responsibility to submit it to the NCSA is a responsibility that we owe it to the public that we do serve. And lastly, because it is not a long closing remarks, 
We want to thank everyone for taking their time out, coming either in person or tuning in virtually to this presentation. We hope that it has motivated you, has given you food for thought as you go about your daily um, work, even motivate change in how we do things. And in our last presenter, with our last presentation, I hope that also gives you tremendous thought as employees, as supervisors, as departmental heads, that substance use and addiction is just not in the community, it is also with our co-workers and maybe sometimes even with ourselves. So with that saying, thank you all for listening, for coming, attending, and we look forward for your timely participation a little later this year as we roll out the 2022 Barden Report by October. <laughs> Good day all. <laughs>